And we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to a standing edition of the uh, Matt Brown Show. I've been requested by my guest today to stand for the entire episode. And uh, he is none other than Vusi Timberquite. Thanks for being on the show, brother. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Good night. <laughs> Do you have bells here? <laughs> well, well. You totally have bells. I've now finally lived. You can totally ring that bell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That bell or your bell? Anyone. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so, moving on. So <laughs> moving on. So, uh, yeah, man, this one's been a, a while in the coming. Thanks for uh, for being here today. Sure. Um, and uh, obviously, we chatted before we started this whole thing. It seems like we're on this same timeline. I don't know if that's the right, sure, right sure. time to use it anyway. Uh, but we can get into all of that and we can totally get into all of that. Uh, but for those of um, you who have been living in a tree and you don't know who Vusi is, uh, Vusi, why don't you put your story on a billboard for us? Uh, yeah, that's tough, eh? Um, so, made, I suppose, made my name as a professional speaker, two-time world champion public speaking. I still hold the world record in the five-minute format of public speaking. Um, a world record in that format? Yeah. So how, do, what's the rec- how do they measure that? So, there's, um, so, there are two societies in the world of public speaking. There's the, there's the American one, which is more known, Toastmasters. Oh, and yeah, that was yeah. started in the 19... 19- 1930s, I think it is. But there's one called the ESU, which is the society I belong to. The English Speaking Union was created by the British, actually, as a way to spread the language of English around the world. Hmm. It uh, was started in 1883, I think it is. It's the oldest society of speakers in the world. And um, so I competed in it uh, twice and every time I competed. But when you, do in, when you go and compete, there are actual judges and then you get like scored. Hmm. And so what happens is countries have their own competitions, and then when you win the country one, you go to the world championship and then you meet the people who are the best in the world in that year and then you compete. Hmm. And there are different formats. There's the five-minute format and then there's the impromptu format. I'm, I'm much better now at impromptu than I used to be, but five minutes prepared, I'm unbeatable. <laughs> That's a fact. And he means that. Yeah. When he says that, for those of you who are listening, <laughs> he just gave me the death, squ- the death stare. No, like... <laughs> just right there You don't come back at that Don't ask me about that That's just fact <laughs> And what else are you up to? Um, so, so I did that And then I Kind of coming from my speaking business I built a small consulting business Which I sold Exited the consulting business And for my sins Was convinced I could help entrepreneurs hmm. uh, Somebody had told me What was it now? Five, six years ago When I started my VC firm That I would have learned What I've learned I probably wouldn't have done it but then I took uh, 10 million rand of my own money and I seeded it and I started my growth fund, which is our VC firm. Mm-hmm. I'm busy going through a rebrand at the moment. And um, I was like, I can help. I can help entrepreneurs build. I actually tell you where it comes from. So I was invited by a lady called Keeling, who runs a company called Rapid Blue. And she went and got a license to do Dragon's Den. Mm. And so they rang me up and they were like, we're doing Dragon's Den and uh, we'd love to have you on the panel. And uh, I was, you know, you um and you are, and you um and you are. And I was like, you like, look, I got uh, Duncan from, uh, you know, he's banging <laughs> on about something called Shark Tank, something with fish. Yeah. So the actual <laughs> truth. So Peter Jones, who's on the Dragons Den in the UK, is a good friend of mine. Oh, cool. Uh, in fact, I, at the time, he wasn't a good friend. I, I, I was. He and I have a friend and mutual. And so I rang up Darren and Darren connected me to Peter. And since we've become really good friends, so I rang up Peter and I was like, look, they've asked me to do this thing. Tell me a bit about it. And he was just very frank. It was like, this is what you should expect. Go and do it. Um, so I went and I did Dragon's Den and I'll never forget. So I'm sitting on the panel and the way they shoot the show, by the way, is you go through two weeks of shooting. So what you watch over 13 weeks is actually only shot over two weeks. Mm. The reason if you watch every season of Dragon's Den, the dragons wear the same clothes is because what actually happens is they serve you entrepreneur after on entrepreneur, right? They come one after the other, but you don't know when the deals are going to happen. So when they edit the show, they've got to do it in such a way that there's at least a deal a show. So you wear the same clothes. That way, if there are five deals done and then the next 30 entrepreneurs, there are no deals done, they edit it in such a way that you can at least have one good story every single episode. Uh huh. So anyway, so I'll go and do Dragon's Den and there were 100 and I think just over 113 entrepreneurs that came. Um, and of the 113 entrepreneurs that came, there were nine or nine deals that were done. Of those nine deals that were done, two were to black African people. And I was, I was, I remember just, I was like, afterwards, I couldn't, my mind couldn't adjust to it because I was just like, I looked at the panel and it was four black people, three of us black African mm. with one white person. 
But when we were investing, we were replicating the very same system where like, there's no money going to black entrepreneurs. And then I started thinking, what's the problem? The, the real problem is, as you know, when you build a business, the business doesn't cut you any favors because of your race. So mm -hmm. we do have a, a race and a gender imbalance. But at the end of the day, profitability doesn't ask, are you black or white? It's either positive or negative. Your debit orders don't go, I'm not debiting because you're black or white, right? So the real challenge I, I thought was, the issue is that actually most of those entrepreneurs that came to pitch hadn't learned how to speak the language of enterprise. Hmm. So I can come up with a great idea, but how do I express it? How do I talk about understanding the difference between net and gross margin, knowing what EBITDA is, when am I going to break even? When you explain it to the entrepreneur, they get the concept. So they're not unintelligent. They just don't understand the concept and the language of the investor. That's really the problem. So the minute you start interrogating them, you go, okay, so I like the business, I like the idea. Tell me a bit about your gross margins. And their eyes just glaze over, right? And so what happens is you're denying the person who could access that capital, the opportunity to that capital, because they don't speak your language. And I was like, this seems like a good problem to solve. Let me do it. So you basically help them speak that language and unlock access to funding slash markets. Is yeah. that, well, that's so it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know if you've ever, I'm sure you've done this where you, so you start with a problem and like you've defined it. And then the more you research, the bigger the problem becomes because mm -hmm. you realize, yeah. That's why we have two companies to solve that same problem now. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, and I think for any person who's like really into solving complex problems, what happens is you realize that the problem is in expression, it's simple but in composition, it's complex. So the nuances, right? Exactly. And, yeah. they're, and they're like, it's like a network of issues that feed into the other. So the person doesn't understand gross margin because they went to a school where perhaps maths and science is not a, sign, a, a subjects that are, that are really pushed on, right? So by the time they get to like grade nine, they can opt for the humanities, which is not a problem. But when they grow up then, they don't understand how to put a simple algebraic equation. Now, if you can't do a simple algebraic equation, there is no ways you can understand the flow of an income statement. Mm. So, so I was like, okay, so there's, a, there's, a, there's an education problem. And then, and, then, and then we start solving the education problem. And then another problem came up, which is, I call it the poverty premium. So people pay a premium in this country for being poor. Every poor person pays more than you and I because all the services are built away from poor people. And then I researched why that is. I've read this fascinating book. I recommend it to every South African that loves their country. It's called The Memoirs of Furvut, written by the Furvut, the architect of apartheid. And what people don't know about Furvut is he was actually an academic. He wasn't a politician. He taught at Martis, the University of Stellenbosch. And um, he came up, he wrote the paper on the concept of separate development. In Afrikaans, there's no such word for apartheid. Apartheid is not an Afrikaans word. It's literally a made-up word, apartheid. Anyway, so in the book he says, what you should do is to create two systems of development. But to make the system sustainable, you need, input, you need inputs of cheap labor and a high growth economy. So the way you do that is you create the majority of the population, black people. You put them in these concentration camps called townships, marginal access to electricity and some services. You give them a bad education called Bantu education. And right next to every single township, you build an industrial area. That's why in South Africa today, next to every township is an industrial area. Only two townships break those rules. The one is Deep Slut because it was built after 1994. And the second is Alex because the rate of population growth in Alex, people actually grew into the industrial area. The industrial area is now a township. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so if you get a bad education, we can then make you work in the factories for low wages. The factories make goods which you sell in the CBD. And the people who shop at the CBD come from the leafy white suburbs. That's why the country's built that way. So the reason poor people pay a premium is because the architecture of the country is always so that the services and goods are far away from the poor people that need them. Mm. It has a racial expression because of how it's architectured. But if you just go look throughout the country, so I was like, okay, so now we've got to fix that problem. Because you can't fix the education problem and not fix the poverty premium problem. How do you even start with that? You have to, oh, that's a great question. It's design thinking 101, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's design thinking 101, which is what you have to do is you have to see the world from the perspective of the person for whom you are solving the problem rather than the perspective of the inputs to solve that problem. It's what I call, so, yeah. so think about. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the perceptions of the problem that you need to understand. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's the difference between the architect and the builder, right? The builder goes to build your house, I need X amount of bricks. Amount. He's thinking about the inputs. The architect goes, how do I want this house to feel and look? So he sees it from the user's perspective. And so the only way to do it is to see it from the user's perspective. 
And actually, there's only one way to do it, which is kind of what we're doing, which is you've got to take all the infrastructure and build it in the townships. It's as simple as that. You literally got to take the infrastructure and build it in the township. So there's way too many accelerators in towns, way too many incubators in towns. I mean, Jesus. Do you know that there's over a thousand of those exactly. in, in Africa? I mean, there you go. And yet, and yet, you will How's still find- How's your incubator find doing? Is it good? Well- <laughs> I'm launching mine now. Christmas <laughs> presents. You know, but I mean, I, so, 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 the, so then now think about it. We were talking about the complexity of the problem. So you've got, you've got a building incubator. Then you've got to situate it in a place that's close to the people for whom the incubator is built. By the way, whatever programs you put in have got to be in a language that those people can understand. See? Now what problem are you solving? Is it a location problem? Is it a geography problem? Is it a, an education problem? What problem are you solving, right? So as we've been building the business, we realized actually, just a final note on this, that whereas venture capitalists think money is the answer to the problem, it's not. Money for me is like a computer. It's like mm. a technology. It's an enabler. It's not the solution. It's the platform. So a lot of VCs are going out to market and going, we've created a VC fund for 200 entrepreneurs. Hey, black, uh, black entrepreneurs, come, mm -hmm. we've got a 200 million rand fund. Yeah, loads of that. And then there's crickets because nobody's building the, the distance between the competency, the input, and the actual requirement of the capital. Mm, that's interesting that, eh? I think, yeah, um, I know, do you know, I suppose you know more people than I do in this space, like obviously Knife Capital yeah. and all those guys, yeah. Michael Yodah and 12J, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah. And it's interesting. They, I got an email uh, last week from, in fact, when was it last week? Yeah, it was last week, Thursday uh, on LinkedIn. Hey, Matt, you know, I have a business and I'd like to pitch it to some VCs. Can you help? Mm. I was like, sure, no problem. I'll tell you what, why don't you send me an overview? And if, it's, uh, if it feels like investable opportunity for me, then I'll pass it on. And I said, by the way, don't ever pitch a VC mm -hmm. on email because they mm -hmm. get literally thousands a week True and story. no one cares. Yeah. And they will only look at deal opportunities that come from their network. That's so right. VC referred Matt or Matt yeah. referred whoever it is. So anyway, so I get this thing back and it's like a business plan, right? Sort of thing. And it's like, we're a consulting company. So that's immediately non-investable in my yeah. view um, and then it was like here are all the things that we're going to do and it was from like HR recruitment to IT oh, managed geez. services there's literally 12 things on there and of which every one of those 12 things you could build a business on right and so the reason why I'm telling you the story is because she was looking for venture capital and so for me it's about if you put yourself as you say put yourself in the shoes of the person and problems you're trying to solve in the case of the small business owner or the founder right she went and then uh, by the way she wanted 550,000 Rand for 25% ownership. So she's valuing her business 2 .2 at already 2.2 million. 2 million. Um, and then she, or she wanted option B was 100,000 Rand uh, uh, with a 15% interest. So debt. Yeah, debt. She wants to lay she, debt she on the services to, business. Yes, totally. Jeez. But this is the thing. So like I see that, you see that, and we can see that straight away. So I phoned her and kind of gave her a sort of come to Jesus. You know, this is what's going on here. Sure. Um, but that's for me, that's a, how do you solve something like that? Where does one start? Because I, I get what you're saying around yeah. the, the ecosystem yeah. and the infrastructure story and access and blah, blah, blah. And I guess yeah. that, I don't know, that's a hundred year gig, I guess. Yeah. Um, maybe longer. But in the case of, well, what can you solve now that's low hanging fruit? That's the mindset that, that people are running around with. Absolutely. Which is never going to wind up in, uh, put them in a position where they have the possibility of succeeding. So I, I can't tell you how many times I've been ruthlessly attacked on social media because of this. My really? view is, yeah, my view is any entrepreneur that wants money to start a business is not an entrepreneur. Like, what are you talking about? That's what I said to her. I said, so if you can't make a hundred grand in a month, then you shouldn't start then a just business. Just don't do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, um, there's also, I think this, and this is a, this is the right word to use. There is this incredibly entitled mindset we've created in South Africa, right? So you say it, they'll call you racist. Um, so don't say it. I but, won't. Um, <laughs> but I think what's happened is, and, and by the way, I was, I was kind of like looking at, I love the, for me, I think one of, the, one of the challenges we have as humanity today is we don't spend enough time looking at the genesis of the problem. So we end up dealing with a symptom rather than the problem. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering why, why is there this entitled mindset? And I think what it is, is because it's been fed as a narrative in our national discourse. So you've been running a series of elections where you've been telling people free. So you go free education, free health, which is the state should provide, but then don't say you're going to do it on an election poster mm -hmm. because you create the wrong national mindset. And then you have state funding institutions, DFIs, whose role it is to provide this capital. And so they're laden with, the, with the, uh, the expectation of money. But everybody says, I'm going to give you money to start a business. 
This is not the conversation we should be having. Mm. You should start a business, raise money to grow a business. And so your passport to calling yourself an entrepreneur is when you've proven the business is fundable for growth. This is important because as you know, not every business is scalable. You know, like if I'm a, I'll give an example. My wife's a chef. She's an amazing chef. Congratulations. This dude, like, <laughs> right. But I'm- You well, look amazing. <laughs> you know, but I'm, I am, you know, my wife's an artist. She's not, she's not trying to build a wimpy. She's an artist. Mm. So for her, every single plate, every single, there's a, you know, I'll watch her just obsess over where to place the bloody lettuce. And I'm like, but Kumbre, it's just lettuce. <laughs> You know, like just put it, put it on the plate, man. The person's going to eat it anyway, right? But she's, she, for her, it's an art. That's not scalable. It's mm. just not scalable. You can't Gordon Ramsay that. Mm -hmm. The minute you scale something, you're going to lose a bit of the art and the artistic ability and the nuance, as you know. The creative aspect goes out the window because you now need to run this thing like a sausage factory. Mm -hmm. This is the difference between, uh, I don't know, uh, five star, Michelin star rich restaurant and uh, McDonald's. You know, mm. but they offer different things. So I think many entrepreneurs just need to try and understand what are you offering? And it goes back to that conversation about what's the problem that you're solving? And also the problem that you think you're going to solve isn't the one you'll probably wind up with. Oh, I could write a book. That's another one. Oh, I could write a book. It's like, don't even bother. Just go and try and sell something. Oh, man. And then figure it out. I think what it is, is you, you recognize, because the other thing is it's the rabbit hole of opportunity, right? So you go, mm -hmm. oh, this problem is worth 10 Rand. Oh, but wait, there's a problem just behind it that's worth 50 bucks. And so what happens is you now pivot your own strategy towards that problem. And when you get to that one, you go, oh no, hold on. Mm. I didn't see it, but there's something behind this that's worth 200 bucks. And so, you know, th there is a, I think there is a discipline sometimes to going, this is actually where we're just going to focus our attention and our time. And, uh, and I, I tell you, an organization for me that's great at that is IBM. Like, okay, go ahead. Well, I mean, I've been, I've been studying IBM since, I don't know, many people don't know, but IBM actually used to make um, um, uh, time talkers for the Nazis. What? Yeah. So really? I, yeah, IBM had to pay, um, there's a word for it. It's not repatriation, but there's a word that you have to pay. Uh, is that good? Reparations, Reparations, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they actually took the head on their balance sheet. But IBM used to do time talkers for the Nazis, right? So if you think about the business of IBM, they went from doing that into the business of mainframes, then into the business of servers, and now into the business of cloud. And yet all throughout that time, they've been very clear about where in the tech ecosystem they work. That's why you, you, you never buy an IBM laptop. Mm. That's why they never built an IBM social media. Because even though technology... As, an, as a sector is huge, they're very clear about where do they stack up and what do they do. Infrastructure, basically. Exactly. And I, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs, we just, you know, you start here and then you're chasing this rabbit hole. And before you end, you know it, you're like, well, how did we get here? Mm. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You, we, but there's also, you don't really have the luxury of saying no when you're on day one. You know what I mean? It's like you got to make money. Yes. Like yes. My, my wife's resigning and, uh, you know, it was our six year wedding anniversary on Saturday. Good man. Thanks Good very man. much. Round of applause. Thank you very much. There we much. go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. See, rent one more year. One here, more guys. year and you get the itch. I know. <laughs> Can't wait. Uh, but, uh, but seriously, she, I say, so she's, she's trying, what should I do? And, you know, and she's very smarter than I am. Thank God. Um, and, but very good at, in different capacity, you know, different skills and that kind of thing. And so I said to her, well, your only focus on day one is to make money That's and then it. figure out what you're going to be after that. It's not, I'm going to do this That's right. and that's how I'm going to make money. It's, that's, that's right. not the truth. Yeah. But you don't have the luxury of saying no. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to say yes to everything. So what yeah. most startups do is they, I've explained our journey and I've, we had to say yes to everything just to make cash, you yeah. know, and we need, and it was a good sacrifice to, to, to have in the sense that, you know, we hired people and we, we got revenue and we started to actually have a business. Cause for me, like your business doesn't really exist until the day that you hire someone. Yeah. Cause then yeah. it's not about you and it's not a freelance business or a, or a lifestyle business and you're no longer self-employed. Now you're responsible and accountable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, of course you know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so on this, on this point about, I think there is, um, and maybe I don't know how we frame it, but there is something to be said about, the, those early days and chasing every opportunity because I think sometimes that's how the business actually finds you because mm. to your point often what you start with is the idea this is why I don't think entrepreneurs should just write business plans I just don't do it just like mm. do the thing 
And as you do the other things, there's the one thing you're going to find where you go, this is cool, I like this. Mm. Um, so I'll tell you right now, in our VC firm, our, our biggest revenue line is not something we started to do. We didn't know we would do it. We were just like classical venture capital, raise capital, get assets under management, charge a fee of X percent. That's not the stuff that, uh, that's, uh, that's That's making growing. you money now. Exactly. Yeah. But we, we had to go through a process of going, oh, there's actually an opportunity here. And now we're looking at that and going, this is going to die out after a little while. And we've kind of trend and looked at where it's going. Mm. And so what are we going to replace those revenues with? And we're, what we're doing is we're building internal products in the business that only we can offer to the ecosystem and to the market. Mm -hmm. That way, we're always hedged against whether or not that business model continues. Yeah, that's the thing. I, agree. I love that point because it's about future pacing yourself. Yeah. You know, because yeah. like, are we, are we going to be a services business, digital kung fu, you know? Yeah. In five years' time, yeah. what does this space look like then? I yeah. can tell you it's hardly going to be any people involved at all. Yeah. It's going to be all AI yeah, and data right, yeah. and shit like that. So, yeah, and, and we're kind of future pacing, you know, with Tech Leadway that we launched um, four weeks ago. That is the play around that because yeah. we've got so much data. It's like, well, what are we doing with it? Yeah. It's like, well, answers nothing. Well, that's stupid. We yeah. should have been a data company, or even though we're only like 12, 18 months old in our current form. But um, but it is certainly about future pacing that view, yeah. Making sure you're building for that. The difficulty, and I don't know how you're doing it, Matt, but I find that the difficulty is um, helping the people in the business understand that. So the vision, ahead. you mean? Yeah, yeah, and also helping them understand that the change is good. I think, and and maybe it's just the culture, right? But people, I find people generally like the job. Right, and there is a difference between the job something does and the actual purpose for the thing. Right, so people like the job. This is the application. This is what I do. Eight to five. This is this is what my performance uh, indicators look like. And then you're going well in future in the business. Whatever it is that you're doing, might I'll give you a great example. So um, we every month have to issue these reports to our clients, and I'd always had a human being writing these reports, and uh, because I am the perfectionist I am, I then have to read every report and I sometimes realize that they've got their spell settings on the, on uh, America English English US and so Got they realize it's spelled with a Z <laughs> <laughs> and then my OCD just goes through the roof because then I go through the entire 80 page document looking for these Z's right and so so we always had a human being doing it now we just bought a system where as as soon as there is an input at source it will generate the report there's no need for a human being mm. okay so I go so I said to the guys doing it, I'm like, okay, so this looks cool, Trevor. Uh, so when can I review the reports? He says, no, 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 no. We're going to input the client's email and they're going to get the report. I'm like, what? <laughs> so there are three, four processes and steps there that I had human beings on that I just don't need anymore. But the value to the client is still there, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge with that pivot is going to your people and going, okay, so we had you doing this, but you know, we think that uh, you might be better utilized in another part of the business. Let's have that conversation. I just find that as a culture, we're not we're not a keen to that, and also it's a generational thing. Mm, mm, mm. Speaking of perfectionists, when you were doing our uh, quote of the day board, yeah, it was very much uh, a perfectionist <laughs> job right there. <laughs> so, with that in mind, <laughs> let's do quote of the day. So, walk us through this one. Uh, so, Rudyard Kipling is one of my favorite poets of all time. Wrote a poem called "If." I recommend it to everybody. And uh, my favorite part of the poem, he says, he says, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, then you'll be a man, my son. <laughs> um, so what he does is he creates a series of these scenarios and he basically talks about, but there's another part of the poem. He says, if you can meet victory and defeat and treat both imposters just the same. I'll never forget, I spent a year just mm. in that part. Treat both imposters just the same. The Excuse idea, you. yeah, the idea that both victory and defeat are independent of you. Um, it's a great, it's a great poem, and I recommend it to everybody. Go and read it; it's really good. So um, we've got a new segment of the show here. We have the uh, gaming console. Yes, it's a rapid fire uh, segment of the show. We're introducing for you your first on it. Right, uh, right. It's called the Pandora's Box. Right. Um, did so. you ever play Mortal Kombat? Oh, Lu Kang wins. Ah. Silent victory. Read it. Victality. Kicks your ass. <laughs> So, Come on. so let's put your water on your chair here and then we're going to move around there okay. and, then, and we're going to play a game and I'll ask you some questions. Sure. Can you multitask? Mm. Okay, you ready? You can turn your mic around and bring it over this way. Is there an obligation for you to let the guest win? Um, I, I'm like hyper competitive. So All right, okay. There's just no way that's happening. 
How many games have you got on this? Uh, 1,300 arcade games. Right. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Okay, let's it. Do arrived it. today. I was so thrilled. So who's your favorite player? Um, it depends which version are we playing. Which, uh, uh, which version would you like? I'm <laughs> uh, the, the original one is probably the better one. Okay, so... Wow. Yeah, it's dope. By the way, if you guys are interested in great Christmas presents for yourselves, and I'm speaking mainly to the guys here, I highly recommend this thing. Where did you find this? Uh, take a lot. Four, four and a half grand or whatever. It's got 1,300 arcade games. Wow. Plugs into uh, your machine and off it goes. Okay, let's do Mortal Kombat 2. Is that good with you? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, here we go. This is going to be fun. You have to answer questions at the same time there, right? Okay. Who are you choosing there? Uh, let's see. Uh, Sub-Zero. You guys want to watch me kick Boosie's ass on Mortal Kombat, you have to go to my Scorpion. YouTube channel and subscribe to the ass beating. Did you just take Raiden? <laughs> totally. All right. Who are you? No idea. My thing just chose it. it like, really? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Let's do it. Okay, I'll kick your ready. ass anyway. Just remember, I'm asking you questions. No pressure. Eh? Okay, okay. <laughs> the Rocker. Oh, yes. Oh, 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 you got oh, nailed, bro. So what's the greatest lesson your uh, father ever taught you? Uh, take your time. Never rush anything and don't worry about what people think of you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you shit at in life or in business? Um, delegating. Delegating? Yeah. Why? Because I think nobody does it better than I do. I suffer from the Naidu syndrome. <laughs> That's a horrible syndrome. Yeah. How do you live with yourself? You're a shit host. You should be letting <laughs> me win this. What the hell? What? You gotta let me hey, win bro, this. You I can't keep it. What are you doing? Pause here, bro. I did it on purpose. You gotta what let me win doing? this guy. No, what the hell? Yeah, yeah, I didn't even yeah, know how you okay. unpause that. No, don't okay. exit. Okay. What have you done? You've done some. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh. Beat down. Round of applause for VC round one. Okay, Ru. You got 94 seconds to, to hit me. And so, um, so you should have you should have delegation. That's surprising for me. He's not talking to me anymore because he's he's different. So, are you competitive? Yeah, I'm gonna bitch. Ah, hey, ah. hey, watch out! I'm gonna bitch slap you now. Yeah, watch this. Ah! <laughs> ah! Uh, is it? Is it? Don't make me come there. Oh! oh. <laughs> there I am. No. <laughs> Where am I now? Oh, damn. There we go. Okay, fine. Woo! Round three. You breaking a sweat yet? So what are your thoughts on the political uh, landscape of South Africa? I think we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the solve for entrepreneurial education in South Africa? Um, in one word. Um, make it simpler. Simpler, much simpler. That's I think. three words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just... Break it down. No fancy, no seriously? fancy words. I'm not letting you beat me. Yet. Oh! Stop doing that! Oh, you! <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, victory is mine. This was a great interview. Thanks for having me. Uh, <laughs> so how was that for you? Was that good? <laughs> <laughs> Would you recommend this as a segment on the show moving forward? I think it's a great segment. I just think it should be a good host and let your guests win. I'm hyper competitive. I see this. No I one see wins. This. No I one wins. This. You're just so me. lucky. I, ch I didn't choose my uh, my first my you know player number one. Yeah, no, exactly. I well, let you have it. You know, you can always have a doing. rematch after this. You know it's what I mean. You're more than welcome. We'll just get you to come back the next time someone else is on the yeah, show, just like Boosie's taking over. <laughs> 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 so um, we have similar trajectories. I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the show. Um, you're looking at America. Yeah. Can we talk about it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. Um, so congratulations. All good. New York. Yeah, so we set up, I set up my office in New York in Jan this year. So I've kind of been going up and down. Um, yeah, it's just, it's time. I think you, you, you have to know, you have to know when you've done your part and you have to know when you've, you've truly expressed and found your place in the market. I'm at the stage now where I'm a big, very big fish in a small pond. Mm. And so you have to go to uh, the place where you can, you know, Stretch yourself again. And you, I think you kind of know when you, when you get to a place, as you will know, mm. as you know, you get to a place where you just stop learning because you're not being challenged anymore and mm -hmm. it feels the same and it's the conversations are the same. Um, I said to a client the other day, they invited me to speak at a conference of theirs and I was like, I was sitting there listening because I was 
on in the afternoon and I got there in the morning. And I was like, but you guys were talking about this three years ago. It was just, mm -hmm. you haven't moved. Mm -hmm. um, so you do, you, I think you get to a point where you, you also have to grow personally, right? So you have to know where you're challenged, what, what's cool and, and how to go after it. Yeah, I feel that same way with uh, the podcast. It's like been four and a half years, yeah. you know. Yeah. You're, you're definitely one guest I've wanted to have on the show for a while. Um, but... I mean, you know, if I can, like, I'm obviously Austin, Texas, obviously, as I mentioned, one of the players, yeah. Tim Ferriss lives there. Yeah. You know, yeah. the access to people. And so yeah. you don't have to deal with the time difference and you're yeah. some guy in, you know, Joburg. Where's South Africa? Is it yeah. in, where in Africa is it? You know, yeah. why do they have white people there? <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's this access to talent and the stretch thing. Now, that's just the podcast. But yeah. yeah. It's interesting how I think, so I was, um, so I'm, I'm busy working on my my next book, and uh, this is a sneak preview. And yes. there's a there's a part in the book I where I talk about how beliefs shape performance. So, mm -hmm. you know, South Africans are terrible at this because we think performance shapes beliefs. So, because Bafana mm -hmm. Bafana is busy losing, we believe that they're terrible, and therefore they perform that way. And maybe what needs to change is not how they perform, but rather what we believe about them. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're the problem and not the team. Anyway. So to make the point, if you look at the first time a human being ran the four-minute mile, what happened after that is for the, in, over the next decade, 28 other human beings did it. So Kipchoge just ran a marathon in less than two hours. What was going to happen now? Every single long-distance runner is going to try and go after that. Mm. You know, when human beings started summiting Everest, people were like, we want to summit Everest. So beliefs shape performance. It's not the other way around. But somebody has to first believe it, go there and do it. The thing about places like the US, which people are not aware of, is the belief systems there. So by the time you get into that environment, you're performing for the belief system. Whereas in South Africa, it tends to be the other way around. It tends to be, well, first do this thing and show us how amazing it is, mm -hmm. then we'll believe in it. I'll give you an example. So we're busy capital raising, right, for our VC firm. And much easier for me to raise a dollar in the US than to raise a rand here. Much, much easier. Fewer meetings and less convincing. That most people go, how's that possible? And by the way, you're solving an African problem. It's actually just because they get it. They're like, there's certain things you don't need to explain to them because they've they get it, they've seen mm. it, they've lived through it. So if you talk to them about building a unicorn or high growth business, they get it, they've seen it. You know, a lot of them have lived through a generation where there was no Facebook and now there is one, where there was no, I don't know, iPad and now there is one. So because they've seen these things happen, there's the belief system that it's innately possible. Whereas you could argue different for South Africa. Mm. Um, we don't, just quickly on the entrepreneurship conversation, we don't lack talent here. That's not our problem. We don't have a talent problem. Um, and, and, and that's the reason why an Elon Musk has to leave South Africa to become Elon Musk. It's not because we lack the talent. It's just because the infrastructure and the belief system is wrong. So, so how, I mean, talk to us about, I mean, you're moving to America. I'm, I personally am frightened about day one when I get there. Yeah. Um, and I think, and I can only talk for myself, I'd be surprised uh, if, you know, an on South African entrepreneur moves to America to open up another office or whatever the case is, is not frightened by it because, and also excited by it because the thing is, I, I, my mentor is a, is a billionaire and uh, I said to him, hey man, you know, I got this green card thing and I'm going to America, what should I do? He says, well, go speak to someone else. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and I was like, that's great. <laughs> But he said, and he told me poignantly in all seriousness, he said, every South African entrepreneur that's gone to America has seen his ass. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, literally all of them. He said, guys who are smarter than you with more money, bigger teams, better products, got fucked up when they were there. What makes you so special? Yeah. You know? And he said to me, look, I'm not saying this to discourage you. I think if you want to go, you know you're going to go anyway. So, you know, it's just to go in there, and he, the words he used was, um, go in there with your eyes open. Yeah, I think the, yeah, yeah if, if I may, I think one of the, and uh, <laughs> so one of the things I think you, when you get into the new market, into the new environment, you have to forget who you were, where you came from. I think a lot of the guys, I've seen a lot of the guys who go there and get their names taken from them. It's because they carry the hubris of who they used to be and then they don't allow themselves to be who they need to be in that space. As, an, as a person. As, absolutely. This is not about your business or your business model. This is you. Mm. You, you still think you're a big deal, right? You. Uh, so, for instance, my agency over there that I work with, um, uh, 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 London Speaker Bureau, 
had and had me on a road show all around the US doing speaking engagements and getting nothing for it. No. What does that mean? You get nothing for no, it? I mean, no, no booking. I wasn't paid. Like oh, I wasn't really? paid. They were just like, we're going to have you speak there and there. And I haven't done, I've been a professional speaker for 15 years. I haven't mm. done that in 15 years. I've never needed to. Mm. But when you get into that market, you got to go, okay, cool. So you got to eat humble pie, basically. Let's do it. Because pay school fees. Yeah, because I have to recognize that I am there where I was here 20 years ago, which is fine. Yeah. But, but then you got to you got to relearn. And I think a lot of people, I mean, I've seen guys go there and just get it wrong because they carry the hubris of who they used to be. And then you want to walk in and speak. You just, it's going to get handed to you. But to what extent do you, can you walk away from yourself? Well, so, then, so one of the things I've, one of the commitments I've made to myself to give more context there is that like on day one, I'm going there not with any preconceived idea about what's going to happen there. In other words, I'm not going there to copy paste. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that would be stupid. Yeah. Um, and do you want to copy paste? And no. even if you did, what would what? that, where would you wind up exactly. and for how long and yeah. how much pain are you prepared to take in order to get to that point? Or going back to your thing about belief. So your motivations are changing. So, and as are mine. So we're looking for something else to stretch ourselves and that's actually closer to, to our center. Yeah. Are you with me? Exactly. Okay. So yeah, so we're both setting up boards and you know all this kind of shit and we're trying to work out structure so that the business can run without you. And that's, the, that's a hard thing to do, number one. There's no rule book for that thing and very few books about it at all. Um, but I think that's one conversation which is like, well, how do you do all of that stuff so that you can scale into another market? The bigger conversation, the more interesting one for me is, is about your inner game mm. <laughs> and who do you need to become in order to make it there? Exactly. Because it's, it's everything is netted out. Like you are nothing. No one gives a shit about who you are. And in yeah. fact, you're on the back foot because yeah. you're not American. Yeah. And, uh, and Americans cu culturally, from what I understand, I have lived there, but I haven't done business there. And that's a very different thing. Like I was, you know, living on super yachts and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, running a business there, as you say, it's very different. And I, and I don't know what, I don't think there is a, this is why most South African entrepreneurs fail when they go to America. But what I would say is what kind of what you said is that they go there with a preconceived idea that that market, what they have here will work in that market. Exactly. And so they either they're they're underfunded or they don't have the right strategy. They don't have no network. That was a one, a big point that was, you know, you've got the London speaker bureau and you're doing these roadshows so that you can build the network exactly. so that you can get the gigs. But on day one, you don't have that network. Even yeah. if you're part of EO or entrepreneurs organization, yeah. like, so what? There's no guarantees in that. So I'm doing a program next year with, um, uh, they're leading, um, uh, what do they call a family fund of funds? So these are like really, really wealthy families, top 10 wealthiest families in the world. And they create these like massive donor funds. These, some of these funds are bigger than the GDPs of many mid-sized countries. Mm. And they try to solve all sorts of problems. And the foundation program I'm on is um, probably the largest foundation program in my space, right? So I'm looking at the course content for this foundation program and it's defining a general partner from a limited partner. And I'm like, I was learning this stuff like, 12 years ago but I recognize that I'm going into a different space and I'm going into that program so that you can build network meet the people who make it work there and also learn what you need to learn to be in that space and so I think that's the point about the hubris I think a lot of us take the wrong person into that space and then you just if you th for me and I was trying to explain this to somebody the other day you almost got to wipe clean the slate of what you know um, and then just the last note is I love, I love, I genuinely love how accepting of new ideas, those much bigger markets tend to be, and it's not just the U S there are many like that, but they tend to be very accepting of new ideas. So one of the very first times I had, like, I never forget, I did a speaking engagement in the U S and this is maybe six years ago. And I absolutely bombed. Like it was terrible. What do you mean you bombed? Like it was terrible. I just like you bombed, yeah. Like just, you got tongue tied, sort of thing, or no, no, no. no. So or, I, the, or the message bomb. No, I did my thing. I the, did my thing. The message bomb. Yeah, they were just like, get this guy off the stage, <laughs> and um, and the reason was because the format is different there to here. So the format there is present new ideas. The format in South Africa is present well known, generally accepted ideas. So if you want to be a great speaker in South Africa, you go and read a Malcolm Gladwell book. You reference a bit of Clayton Christensen. You show us a model by, you know, I don't know, Jeff DeGraw, and executives go, this guy knows his shit he's because amazing. he's referencing best practice. Mm. In America, if they wanted Malcolm Gladwell, they'd get him. Mm. So, that's, so that's not what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. They're looking for new ideas, which is very, very different. Sure. 
It's hard also because it can't be based in the futurist space. <laughs> Because if you've got nothing interesting to say, become a futurist. <laughs> this is a very nice bet. Do you like that bet? <laughs> Are you a futurist? Please don't no, be a futurist. I is, think you're more interesting than that. There is... Even if you were on day one, I don't think that you, is what you should position yourself brother, let as. let me tell you. There is, I've nev- by the way, I've never used that word. What, to positioning? To myself. No. Uh, the word futurist. Oh, but right. there is no such thing. Here's how I know, and I've got a very simple test to prove this, right? If you can tell the future, take some of your own money and give us and make five bets on uh, equity plays. These are listed equity companies that over the next 10 years are going to do well. And then come to us in 10 years and show us how your model helped predict the future. Like for me, Ray Dalio is more of a futurist than many of these people who call themselves futurist. Going to Singularity University, learning the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence, mm. putting it in a presentation is not futurism. It's not what it is. Mm. Let's, let's just be clear here. Mm. And I think to get up on a platform and go, I can predict the future, or right, that's rubbish. I mean, it's just, there, there are so many things moving and so many inputs changing that you can't, that's not, and, and so I think you, you're selling the wrong thing. Um, what are you going to sell? <laughs> no, but I can't tell you that. Hey, buddy, you told you me you no, were going to let the bomb no, go I mean, on the must, show, dude. You must, you must, let, uh, you Come must on. let the story unfold itself. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> watch so as we go. So you don't know. No, 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 I'm very, I'm very oh, clear. You do? Oh, no, no, I'm very clear. Are you, are you very clear? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. This is not, uh, that's not how I'm built. I'm not, uh, it's, it's well thought out. It's there. This is why I was on the road show, right? Because uh. you've got several stuff, you've got several keynotes, you go to the market and you test them and you go, well, this works, this works, this works, this doesn't, this doesn't. One of the things I'm fascinated by about those markets is the rate at which data expires. It's incredible. I talk about that. Right? Like I've seen, I've seen, this is a true story. I've seen South African speakers with content that they were delivering 20 years ago, still deliver that same content today. In that market, the rate at which your content and your story and your data expires is unbelievable. So it, you've also then got to have a very strong machinery of how you're generating that content mm. and, uh, oh, yeah. and, and how, you're, how you're proofing it, right? So it's one thing to generate the content or instinctively know that this is what it is. Mm. It's quite another to have the proof point to go, this is how I've proven that this is what it is, and then package it and sell it to market. It's going to be great. What do you think? Great. What do you think of Gary Vaynerchuk? Um, that's a complex question. Um, I'm a fan of his speed. I'm a fan of his ability to just execute. I really like the way he doesn't hold himself back in terms of, uh, he seems, it seems to me has a great, um, uh, perspective on how to deal with the world. And so Gary will just try stuff. Right, mm. and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and I admire that. I think very few people are able to do that. I I just think his content model is it's not it's not workable. This idea of generating sixty four pieces of content every single day. I mean, in my mind, Gary's you know reality TV star walking around with a microphone every single day churning content, mm. but it works for his business model. It's it's how he builds a sales funnel. You know, that's how he gets uh, the interests up front. So. As long as it works for him, good luck. It's not the way I would do it, but mm. to each the reason own. why I asked that because um, a mate of mine went over there. Also, I don't want to mention his name yet, but um, but basically, he also wants to go to America, become a speaker, and whatever. And he went also over there, and he basically ran into some people who knew Gary Vaynerchuk who were managing him or whatever. So he yeah. gets paid one hundred and fifty thousand US. Who Gary? Yeah, at he was at five hundred now. Is he at five hundred now? Yeah, that's nuts, man. So for me, it's like, how do you? How do you like? It's it's social media. It's like some guy you're paying five hundred grand to put onto a stage to tell me about LinkedIn organic reach. You know what no, I mean? No, he's worth that. He's worth ten times that. Is he? Yeah. What I'm makes t- him great then? Well, or what makes him rebookable? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think great question. So I think the mistake people make when they're evaluating a speaker is they're going, "Well, I'm going to pay you X amount for X amount of time." That's not really what you're paying for. What you're paying for is the extension of the insights you're going to get beyond that me- that moment. The conversation you and I were having earlier about how South Africans, especially South African executives, love the insight. They mm-hmm. just don't have the courage to give it the legs. Right. So, um, I mean, you know, Gary publishes case studies on this, but he's actually got people who've taken some of the stuff he said, gone and tried it, and they've shown the multiply in their business and growth and sales funnel and revenues and a whole host of stuff. So he's, in my mind, he's worth 10 times what he's charging. There's no doubt about it. But also, I live in a world of abundance. So, if he's charging five hundred thousand dollars, 
you know, he should be charging $5 million because there should be 15,000 other Garys. It's like, let, let it be, you know, do, do what you need to do. And what, what are, I'm fascinated to know from you because you, you spend more time recently in the States trying yeah. to try to sell yourself as yeah. a product. I mean, what is the attitude of, you know, Americans specifically in developed economies, probably more broader to African speakers, yeah. thought Again, leaders? Cause very we, open. Are they? Very, there is one proviso. What's Don't that? be them. Mm. And many, this is the point I was making earlier. This is the point many South Africans make that mistake. Many people who come from outside the US, because it's the natural thing to do when you go into a new environment, you want to assimilate, right? You want to be like the environment. They're literally looking for you to become different, to be a different lens, a different perspective. Very different, by the way. And I lived in the UK and I was doing my MBA, but very different to how the British do it. In the British, to be listened to, you've got to be one of them. Mm. In the US, they're like, actually, we like new ideas and new perspectives. Tell us about how you do it from your part of the world. That's been my experience of it. Hmm. Um, cool. So let's do a few more questions and then we'll wrap up. Sure. Um, so if you could get into a time machine and go back to yourself when you were 18 and give sure. yourself one piece of advice about life or business, what would that be? Don't doubt yourself. I took too long. Too long. I listened, I listened to too much of the naysayers, even the ones in your head, which are the ones that are probably more dangerous. Um, and you just take too long to get out of the starting blocks. I would have done it much sooner, much, much faster. I would have been, I would have, I, I would have been at 24 where I am today. So I would have shaved 10 years from my life. Easy. And where do you think that doubt, that imposter syndrome character? Oh, it's the tall poppy syndrome, right? That's what it is. When you're a tall poppy, people look to cut you down. Mm. And so when you live in a society that like ours is fairly shallow, um, the minute you, you know, sprout just a little bit, you become too big for the environment. It's a, and it's that gap, right? You're too big for the current environment, but you're too small for the environment you want to go into. So this is like, so where do I grow this, gr this growing now? There's like this big white space that you're just not sure what should happen in. So I think that's what it is. I mean, I, I think um, for, for many of us, there's also the conditioning. There's the, in my family, for instance, even though my grandfather had, uh, some businesses, but in my family, I'm the first real entrepreneur. So when I started my business, my mom, I'll never forget, my mom said to me, how will you earn a salary not saying more to bus? Mm. And what she actually meant to say was, how are you going to earn a salary without a pay slip? Like, how are you going to live? And it's, it's just the way her mind was conditioned. And so what I've had to do is to break that barrier. And so generations coming after me, when people go, well, this is what I want to do. It's acceptable. It's been seen. It's been done before, mm -hmm. right? There were, when I was growing up, there were three, maybe four career paths. You either a doctor or a nurse or whatever. You, so you were some sort of professional or you were a priest or you were a criminal. These were the only ways that you were enterprising. Otherwise, you went and got a job in a factory. Mm -hmm. So the township I come from, Watville, is completely surrounded by an industrial area of factories because that's where everybody worked. Then you're growing up and going, you want to start your own business. I mean, you've you got to recognize that there's going to be some shifts there as well as a disconnect from a generational perspective. And that's just the way it works. Mm. Um, you're obviously, as you said, a big fish in a small pond. A lot of, the, I mean, you're everywhere in the media and, 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 um, and obviously it's, um, it's great to be in a position of privilege like that. Yeah. Um, and I, I believe that it truly is as I would regard myself in a similar position, not as cool as you though, of course. <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't be here. It'd be the Vusi Timbukwaya show. <laughs> but, um, but the way I'm going with that is um, for, let's just say you've got a, a young female black entrepreneur from Soweto and she yeah. sees Vusi Timbukwaya and she's like, I want to be like him. Um, or I want to have the success that Vusi has. What do you say to that mindset? Yeah, that's a terrible, terrible, terrible um, hope and an ambition, I think. And it's, it's going to sound uh, whatever, but the best you can be is to be the best version of yourself. I think a lot of us, I think a lot of us are trapped in a world where we're trying to be the, the ideas of what we think the world wants us to be. Isn't that? Sure. Preach. That's so powerful, I should tweet it. Yeah. You know, but like the, the world, that. yeah, the world has uh, written a script. There's a, there's a, there's a script. I call it the playbook. So the world has got a playbook and a script and this is what your life's supposed to be. Mm. And so you're chasing your life doing that. So when you're looking at Uvosi and you're saying, I want to be like this guy, it's because you're seeing a different playbook and you like the playbook. What you don't recognize is I had to write the playbook. So I don't even know what the next chapter is. I have an idea. I'm willing to try and test a few things, but it's not really written in concrete. Um, 
So, so th- I would say to that person, don't, by the way, my father said that to me once because my dad and I were like best friends when I was growing up. My dad was the sensei in my dojo, right? So I did Kyokushinkai for, what's that? Uh, probably about 13, 14 years. But my dad was the sensei in the dojo. So one time I'm chilling with my dad. We're watching Suburban Bliss Saturday. This is back in the days when they would have the episode playing and you'd record it in the VCR. Remember that? And, you? In, the, in the VHS and then you would play it. So that weekend we're watching like this, this uh, Suburban Bliss on the thing and we had one of those tapes that was episode and episode and episode and episode and episode. And uh, I'm sitting with my, I'm having a like, time of my life and I looked at him and I said, Dad, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And he said to me, don't be me, better me. And I think that should be every single person you aspire for or to become, you should look at that hero and actively look to be disappointed by your hero. Mm. Take it to the next level. Yeah. That's a great thing. Yeah. Figure out your own story. That's it. And then recognize that there is greatness in the journey, not in the destination. Mm-hmm. I think just too many people are looking to become the front page of the magazine cover. Mm. Take it from somebody who's been in a couple of the magazine covers. Mm-hmm. It's really not. I, there was a time in my life I was on a magazine cover of a leading business magazine. And I was 9 million rand in debt. I had one customer owing me I think it was just over four or five million. I was barely managing to pay my kids' school fees. And I was on the cover. Because this is what people don't get, is there is a difference between asset and cash. So if I look at the balance sheet, I've got all these massive debtors that are supposed to pay me. But that's not what my life reflects. You know, so I think the worst thing you can do is to look at somebody else's life and go, I want to become like that person. They're dealing with issues and demons you do not want to be dealing with. Leave that stuff alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do a lot of talks to kids at, in high school about this book. Um, and uh, it's all about that same thing. And I make that exact point around, um, you know, the, the character in the story. And I use the analogy of a young boy. Yeah. And then I reveal that it was me. And as, as I'm landing these things, which I know are true for them, yeah. getting them to buy into the story. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, that w- what if I told you this young, you know, broken kid, yeah. you know, did all these rad things? What would you say about that? Would that be a remarkable transformation? How many of you see yourself in that story? Yeah. And then, uh, and I talk about in one of the principles about um, this, you know, Instagram filters and the likes and the fucking fake news and, the, you know, that. all that stuff and, and how pointless that is and that there's no such thing as perfect there's only imperfect <laughs> and that you know in the role of fail and failure it's like you have to be f- um fear le- fearless not fearless there's no such thing uh but we're taught and we prescribe to this idea that as you say it's the vc on the front cover it's the headlines from zero to 500 million that's in exactly two right. years and that's what i used to piss me off about entrepreneur media specifically really piss me off because it's like hang on you know for every you know for every, you know, startup found, like, let's just say it's like $10 million raised for whatever the bloody thing is. Yeah. For every one of those, there's hundreds of thousands of crushed dreams. Yeah. And no one's talking about that story. Yeah. No one, and then, by the way, how many dream, How many times have you had your dreams crushed just to get to where you are? Yeah. So, yeah. you understand? So, and it's about painting that, yeah. that narrative to I love them. that. I love that. I think, um, I really like the way you, you phrased it around uh, being crushed, right? Because I think actually what happens is, um, I, 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 I was, I was always, always at this thing. I don't know if you had it. I was like, when I get to this level, ah, bah, bah, ah, bah, bah, they're going to see, you know? And then, and then what happened is I got to that level. Well, the first thing what happened is it's not like you land there. It's not like a plane just lands and you're at that level. You wake up one day and you're like, Oh wait, wait a minute. The, like I'm here. Right. Um, and then when I got there, I realized that at every level there was a different devil. So it's not like I ever, it's not as if you stop having challenges. or you, In fact, quite the contrary. The battles you fight and the ones you win are much smaller than the ones you're going to fight. So the reason you've got to fight them is because you've got to learn the tenacity of how to fight the bigger ones that are coming, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, um, and I think to your point, I, I like the way you talk about the, you know, the Instagram filter. I think um, I said to her, there was this young entrepreneur who came to one of my masterclasses, which are like these free masterclasses I'll do. And, um, we're talking about Instagram. And I said, you know, the word Instagram is interesting because it says Instagram. The gram is instant. Not what's in the picture. Like the pixel is instant, right? And I think, you know, you and I go, you buy a Ferrari, you go outside and you take a picture of your 488 or whatever. Hashtag blessed. Instagram. 
and people go, that's what I want. What they don't recognize, it's the picture that's instant. But behind it, there's a story of toil, right? Yeah. Um, and failure and, and struggle failure. and all exactly. that stuff you mentioned. Exactly. And a doubt. Exactly. You know, stepping out of the shadow of your father. Let me, let me, and let yeah. me give you a, a, an amazing truism. Whoever's posting that picture is hiding something. <laughs> that's why they're posting it. Mm-hmm. There was a, a somebody over the weekend at Domkop. Um, people who follow me on Twitter will know that's cool. But there, <laughs> there was a Domkop over the weekend who went and posted a picture, like a uh, new house, new balcony, whatever, and they posted this thing. And I just looked, and somebody said to me, you're going to comment, and I just left it alone because I recognize what you're doing. What you're doing is you're masking. There is something happening inside that you're, mm. that you're masking. Um, do you do your own social media? Yeah, I mean, I've got a team that does my social yeah. media, but I'm very involved. I check it like all the time. Really? Yeah, yeah because I'm, I, I, f- so first I'm not perfect. And, and I think that's a part of what makes people appeal is that you have imperfections. Um, but also I'm, I try to be careful of what we're saying and how we're communicating. Mm. Because there are parts of my life that you could take and package perfect and it would sell. Because, you know, it's, it's supported by true legitimate stuff but that's not all my life is. Mm. And then there are parts of my life that are just not up for discussion. So I don't, you know, we don't, I don't talk private. I don't want to, that's not your business. It's my business. Mm. Um, so you, you do, I think, have to guide your people to, to help them understand. But the, as you know, there's the execution and the scale of stuff. I, I can't be sitting there worrying about what should the font be or, mm. you know, how to write the caption. Yeah, I took, I've taken quite a lot of flack this year on social media how come? for stuff I didn't post. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well now you're growing brother now you're growing <laughs> that's when you know you've made that's it. when you know it's like wait who, who posted who did this <laughs> yeah exactly so it's kind of like it's kind of like a customer went and bought a burger but you didn't make it yeah, and then yeah, they so phone you and go yeah, yeah. this is a terrible patty you go, yeah. i didn't i didn't make the burger yeah, exactly but you can't tell them that exactly because for some reason but you have to defend it but matt that's a great growth problem you know, it's kind of one of the ways you know you're growing is when you have problems you weren't having before. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, life's one big problem and then you die. Nice. That's I, my latest thing. I've had, uh, so you had people attack you for, you know, stuff that you didn't post. Mm-hmm. I've had people come after me for stuff that I deleted. What? Yeah, because the team went and posted it and then I saw it and I was like, this is off brand, take it down. Mm. And then you delete it. But then what's happened is somebody's gone and seen it. And screen and, capped it. Well, either screen capped it, downloaded it, or worse, they've shared the link. And somebody else is trying uh, to watch yeah. it. Now this thing is not live anymore. Mm. And they're going, where is X? Oh, it's, it's gone. It's just not on brand. So you just take it down. Mm. But, you know, we, as I was talking to you about scaling. So what we're doing now is we're trying to put a quality check process in place. So there'll be a single person who goes, is this on brand? Does it tick these boxes? Okay, cool. It can fly. And that, of course, means there's going to be a slowdown in process. So the bigger you get, the more lethargy builds in. It's, I think it's a, it's a trade, right? It's a trade-off. But I can't be raising the amount of capital I'm raising and then have stuff that's kind of reckless or not on brand communicating to market. you got to kind of get, get the mix right. What do you need help with? Ah, I mean, my bank account, uh, I'll give it to you. Great. Um, no, I, um, what do we, oh, two things, actually very simple. So the first thing, three things, three things, now that you've asked. Uh, the first thing I need help with is we're busy, you know, we're finalizing the final stages of our uh, hub and I really, really need anybody who can offer any services. So the way the hubs are built, the hubs are built in townships. They're completely free for the community to use. The community pays nothing. They cost about four and a half million rand to five million to build the hub. And then we put in an additional uh, six, seven hundred thousand rand worth of furniture, three hundred thousand rand worth of computers. They get free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi's, boardrooms, the, the whole lot, right? And we're so we're busy bringing those on stream now. What I need are people who operate in the space that can offer anything. So whether you're a licensed Microsoft service provider or you've got a teaching business or something like that, come and offer your services because we cool. we genuinely want to take those people that I spoke about at the very beginning who don't have access to the education and just ex- and just expose them to it. The mm. idea behind the hubs is you want to take the infrastructure that's available in our world and bring it over to that world, right? Uh, so that's the first thing I need help with. The second thing is I run these master classes. They're completely for free. They're really, really cool. And the the master class are probe led, not program led. So we don't cool. start a master class with a presentation. We nice. just stand there and people ask questions and we answer. And so uh, anybody who follows the master classes, I'd love to get feedback on what do you think works, what doesn't work. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm constantly looking for people to work with on my books and keynotes. So anyone who's out there that's got a keen eye for new ideas, uh, graded research, that type of stuff, hit me up, let's chat. How do people get in touch with you? On all my social medias. Mm -hmm. Probably the best way to do it is to DM me on Instagram or even better than that, send me a invitation with a little write up on LinkedIn because I look at that one personally. Cool, nice one. Last question for you. Why do you do what you do? What, you know, you spoke about uh, America speaking. Obviously, you got the hub, entrepreneurship, you know, facilitation, development, stuff like this. When you package all that thing together into a nice, this is Vusi Timbekwea box, why do you do it? My role, so the name Vusi means to bring to life. My father's name was Vusumuzi. And when, and so before my sister, who's older than I, was born, my parents had two kids, both passed. And my sister's name is Mbali, which means a rose. My name is Vusi, and my younger, brother's, my younger brother's name is Muzi. So my father split his name between the two of us. My role is just to lift uh, spaces. I elevate, that's all I do. So if I come into an environment and entrepreneur is thinking here, I take him here. If I come into a conference and the conversation is here, I take it here. That's all I do. The instruments are different, obviously, whether it's public speaking, providing capital, mentorship, facilitation, whatever it is, the instruments are different, but I'm just here to leave the world a better place than I found it, genuinely, and I believe that. So we have a Monday morning meeting at the office every day called our XCOM meeting. So all of the companies that we operate, everybody meets, and because it's different companies, we have to cross-communicate, so the XCOM. Ah, uh, smart. It's really cool. I know, I know. And um, You can ring the bell now. <laughs> <laughs> and we end every single meeting with the same statement and everybody says at the same time, let's go change the world. Huh. Genuinely because we believe it. And we don't think changing the world is changing the axis on which it shifts, but it's just doing one very small thing today that's going to elevate somebody else's perspective, help them see things differently, act differently, be different. We don't get it right all the time, but that's the ambition. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, look, um, I will be in, in America soon with yeah, you, my friend. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'll definitely... But you're not closing down the business, right? No, 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 no. Oh, there you go. No, so no, you no, and no. I are the same. So you're going to yeah, do yeah, the yeah, up yeah, and yeah. down and... The yeah, pretty much, yeah. 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 So, yeah. but no, but definitely keen to follow your journey very closely. All good. And you know what we should do? Yeah. We should do a live show in New York. Yeah, I'm in. I mean, if you pay for it, I'll get the... Dude, I'm, in, I'm <laughs> minted, bro. I'll tell you what. We'll do, the li- we'll do the live show in New York. We can use my office in New York to do the live show. No problem. Cool. If you come on the masterclass as a guest. Amazing. Where? where? Well, we do them all the time, but oh. we've got a couple coming up. We've got one tomorrow at the Global Entrepreneurship Week. We've got oh, one on Thursday. Uh, we're doing two for Global Entrepreneurship Week. But generally, listen... Anybody who's in these seekers, I've got guys who are so jealous. Our digital agency in Cape Town told us we've now touched 500,000 unique entrepreneurs, both on and offline, using that masterclass. It's like kicking ass and taking names. Holy but shit. the way it's delivered is it's, you don't go there and preach. You go and teach. You go and, and people ask you questions. And sometimes the answer is, I don't and know. And it's literally like Q&A. It's exactly that. It's, hey, Vusi, I've got this problem. So much better. What do I do? Yeah, because- So t- much better. I've got to tell you, very quick. I know we've got to wrap. But here's how I came up with the masterclass. I kept getting, I get like 400 emails a day. But I was like inundated with these emails of entrepreneurs asking what I felt was like very simple, basic stuff. Mm. And I was like, but there's all these accelerators in it. What the heck is the problem? Like something is wrong here. And then I realized that you could actually theme all the, uh, the questions into like boxes. So you could bunch them into like boxes. Then I thought, but who else has got these problems? And we've got this wonder of this thing called the internet. Why are we not answering these problems and just helping people? And then I got invited to speak at this conference, paid an awful lot of money to do it. And the conference is at Santon Convention Center and it's for entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And I look in the room and all the entrepreneurs are sitting there like, you know, dry lips. They're so hungry for a little bit of capital, some mentorship. Mm-hmm. The room costs half a million rand to book. You've paid the tech crew another 1.5 million. You've got me and 10 other speakers, but the people for whom we are here are getting speeches and presentations. That's not what they need. Mm. So I was like, we've got to flip this on its head. So the way the masterclasses are done is there's absolutely no pretense. We don't even provide furniture. Guys come in and sit on the floor. All we do is we put together the masterclass, we live stream it usually on, uh, what's the, Periscope? We live stream it yep. on Periscope on yep. Facebook. And uh, all the entrepreneurs come and they're completely for free and they ask any questions that they want. When's the next one? I'm keen. Uh, so we've got one tomorrow, got one on Thursday, but I'll send you the calendar, have a look, mm. and uh, we'd love to see when we can have you. That's amazing. Thank you so much for the for the privilege of being oh, invited. Good, it's always great to be I able to- I want to learn all about your inner game. Well, I'm going to have to sign a book for you now. Good man. How many books have you got in you? In me? Mm. 
That's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've got I've got this amazing idea for a book. Let's test. No, I can't okay, tell let's that. do it. Let's test it here. Let me. The crowd's ready. So, I guys, listen disposal. to this and tell me if this is going to work. This is the idea I've got about the book. Okay, the book is called Black, and here's what I want to do. And I'll tell you how I came up with the story about the book. So, um, about a month and a half ago, I went to Senegal, and then after Senegal, I went to a place called Gori Island. And Gori Island was a port where uh, slave masters would transport slaves from. So they were pulling slaves from all over West Africa, sending them all through all sorts of channels, but basically using the Niger River, as it's actually pronounced, the Niger River. They get them to Senegal, and then they send them to this place called Gori Island for three months. They test them for diseases and a whole host of things. It's a terrible place to go. But on this Gori Island, there's a door. It's a single door called the Door of No Return. And the reason it's called that is because if the slave went through that door, that was it. They never made their way back home again. Um, anyway. So I'm at this place and I thought, I as a person am having this lived world experience. My parents had a different one, slaves had another, and before them, different. So what I wanted to do, because I was trying to teach African history to my kids, and I didn't know where to start it from, so I thought, I'm going to write a book called Black. And each chapter is going to talk about a lived experience of black people at different times all throughout history. Hmm. And the chapter never concludes it's just like, this is the experience. And then what I'm going to do for the final chapter is as you turn it, it's going to be an empty page. And the idea there is that it's going to be just for black people to win. I'm going to, hey. ring, I'm going to ring your bell for you. Ah, comrades, ah, we're together. Hey. hey, I think that's red. See, so that's the stuff I need people to like work with me on. It's that's very, very cool. cool. Yeah. That's very cool. I do like it. I do like it. When's it coming out? <laughs> you know the problem is if I commit the date then you've got to do it right? yeah, yeah. yeah totally well that's what happened to me I didn't want to write that thing at all by the way by the way how hard was it writing a book it's like the most difficult thing right torturous yeah yeah. torturous yeah what well, has to come fr- as you said you see the thing uh, with the futurist gig it's like you know I can mention books but I won't yeah. But my point is, it's like, if you write about the thing that you think that, that the world wants to hear about, it's going to flop. And I've had that. In most, in most cases, it will flop. But if it comes from you, yeah. it's people resonate with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Also, yeah. it's fucking way easier to write. Yes. Yeah, because it just flows, right? It's like it, you can write that book. Yeah. It comes, it comes from inside you. Because Exactly. Yeah. So even that's totally linked to you. You know what I mean? I got you. Yeah. I don't know why we haven't met sooner, brother, but I'm humbled that you've had me here. Good man. Bro, it's been an absolute privilege, man. Thank you, brother. All the best. <laughs> Pussy Timber everybody. Cheers, guys. Thank you.